Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and after getting our first look at AMD's new RX 6600 XT yesterday, today we are following that up with a review of Sapphire's RX 6600 XT Pulse. So for this generation we've actually reviewed a fair few of Sapphire's Nitro Plus cards, but we've never actually seen a Pulse card based on an RX 6000 GPU. For the Pulse then, Sapphire is very much positioning this as a back to basics cards. That means it's stripped back of flashy features, so there's no RGB lighting, there's no dual BIOS, and there's no onboard fan headers or anything else like that. Instead, it's very much focused on delivering a good cooling experience with low noise levels and a clean design aesthetic. Sapphire has also tried to keep the price as low as possible, so the MSRP for the Pulse is actually going to be $399, so that's just $20 above AMD's baseline MSRP. In this review, we're going to be putting the car through its paces and finding out just how good it is. Kicking off with the design of the card then, Sapphire has gone for quite an understated approach here. The plastic shroud is almost entirely black, with just a couple of red lines running the length of the shroud. I have to say I really do quite like this appearance, it's definitely more stealthy all round than the 5600 XT Pulse which had more silver and red elements. This one is almost entirely black and for me it really does tick the boxes. We can also see the Pulse is using Sapphire's Dual X cooler, meaning there's two fans, each of which measures 90mm across. These also use Sapphire's new hybrid fan blade design, so there's a small ring going around the outer edge of the fans which Sapphire says should give you all the benefits of a traditional axial fan in terms of the low noise levels, but you should still get some of the airflow pressure benefits of a blower style fan. Elsewhere, we can also see that the top side of the card is home to the Sapphire and Radeon logos printed in red text. It is important to note though, there's absolutely no RGB lighting on this card anywhere, so whether or not you think that is a good or bad thing really does come down to your personal view of RGB. Flipping the card over now to take a look at the backplate, it's a full length metal design which is always a good start. It's almost entirely black as well but with just a little bit of red in the form of that ECG graph which nicely ties in with the Pulse branding. We can also note one cutout in the backplate behind the back of the GPU die and there is also a cutout towards the end of the card to allow airflow to pass directly through the heatsink and out of the back of the card. Sapphire has also done well to keep the dimensions of the card in check as the pulse measures 240 by 119.85 by 44.75 millimeters. That means it is just about thicker than a standard dual slot card, but really not by much, and I would expect this to fit in pretty much any case on the market. It's also pretty lightweight as well, tipping the scales at just 614 grams, so if we compare that to the Gigabyte Gaming OC Pro we reviewed yesterday, it's almost 300 grams lighter. Moving on though, we can also note this single 8-pin PCIe power connector, while display ports are standard with three DisplayPort 1.4 and then one HDMI 2.1. Opening up the card to take a look at the PCB now, we can see the design is broadly similar to the Gaming OC Pro, so we would guess that both vendors are using a slightly tweaked version of AMD's reference design. What we can see here is an 8 plus 2 phase VRM, with the GPU VRM controlled by international rectifiers IR35217. Sapphire is using OnSemi's 302045 and 302155 MOSFETs across the GPU and memory VRM, but the memory VRM uses OnSemi's NCP81022 M controller. Speaking of the memory as well, we can see the use of Samsung 16 gigabit per second modules. Taking a look at the heatsink now, this is a pretty simple design, using a single fin stack and just two heat pipes. The GPU die contacts with a small copper slug, while the memory contacts with a secondary base plate. There's also another base plate used to contact the GPU VRM, and an absolutely tiny contact point for one of the memory MOSFETs as well. Lastly, it is also worth pointing out that there's no thermal pads on the underside of the back plate. Now, this doesn't make a massive difference, but it is good to see where possible, so I would have liked to see some thermal pads here just to contact the back of the PCB. Mm -hmm. 
that's pretty much it for our look at the design now though, so let's move on to our testing. For this, as always, we used our regular GPU test system provided to us by PC Specialist. This is built around Intel's i9-10900K, overclocked to 5.1 GHz on all cores. That's paired with the Asus ROG Maximus 12 Hero motherboard, and we also have 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 memory, clocked at 3600 MHz. Kicking off with the thermal testing then, it's honestly not a surprise to see the Sapphire Pulse is running hotter than the Gaming OC Pro we looked at yesterday. The Pulse is, after all, a smaller and lighter card, with three fewer heat pipes used as well. Still, the peak GPU temperature of 72 degrees is very respectable, and the hotspot temperature of 92C is well within AMD's limits. In fact, we can actually see the delta between the GPU and the hotspot temperature is lower for the Pulse at 20 degrees versus the Gaming Pro OC with a delta of 27 degrees, and that could be a result of Sapphire using a flat copper base plate as opposed to Gigabyte's direct heat pipe contact approach. Those thermal results look even more impressive when we factor in the noise levels. Even under full load, the fans barely spin. We saw them ramp up to just 34% or 1230 RPM, and that really does create a near silent graphics card. You simply would not be able to hear the fan spin unless you got your ear right up against the card itself. It really is very impressive stuff and shows the Pulse is doing what it's set out to achieve. For our noise normalized testing then, we had to increase the Pulse's fan speed up to 56%, or 2040 RPM, generating a significant amount of extra cooling power. That resulted in the GPU temperature falling by 12 degrees compared to stock, with a new peak of 60 C, while the hotspot also fell to 78 degrees. This is still a bit warmer than the Gaming OC Pro, but again, we would expect that due to the size difference and the level of sophistication between the two coolers. We also have power draw to look at, and this is the power draw of the graphics card only, tested at 1080p in Cyberpunk 2077. Here, the Sapphire Pulse drew 158.7 watts, compared to 161.1 watts for the Gaming OC Pro. There's honestly really not much difference there at all, and both are very efficient cards. We can also see both cards performing very similarly when we get to our clock speed behavior testing. Over our 30 minute stress test, the Gaming OC Pro averaged 2610 MHz, compared to 2605 MHz for the Sapphire Pulse. We can even see how similar the clock speed behavior is in the above scatter chart. We've even deliberately truncated this so the range shows between just 2500 and 2700 MHz to give you a better look at how closely the frequency plots overlap. Considering then that both GPUs were effectively running as fast as each other over our 30 minute stress test, you may well be wondering what that means for our gaming benchmarks. Well, we won't go through every single game again, so if you do want to see all of the benchmarks we ran on the 6600 XT, please do check out our review from yesterday, but here we'll be showing a selection of titles at 1080p. Honestly, it's really not a surprise to see the margins between the Sapphire Pulse and the Gaming OC Pro are essentially non-existent. Both are factory overclock models and are essentially as fast as each other. In fact, the single biggest difference between the two came in Gears 5, and that was a margin of just 1.8%. In Cyberpunk 2077, Hitman 3, and Resident Evil Village, the average frame rates fell within 1% of each other, so there would be absolutely no way to be able to tell the difference between either card when actually gaming. Of course, we did also try our hand at some manual overclocking, and the results we got here were actually slightly better than what we saw with the Gaming OC Pro. So we were able to push the GPU core up to 2990 MHz, while we were able to add an extra 300 MHz to the memory, bringing that up to 2300 MHz. That resulted in a real-world average operating frequency of 2933 MHz, which is about 130 MHz faster than what we could manage with the Gaming OC Pro. That added frequency on the GPU and memory then resulted in gains of between 9 to 11% in the three titles we retested. So that is a slightly better relative gain compared to the Gaming Pro OC. We do have to stress though that this can vary from sample to sample, 
but it is good to see you can squeeze a bit more out of this chip, even if the days of an extra 20% boost to frame rates are long gone. It is worth pointing out though that power draw did rise a fair amount when overclocked up to 188.1 watts at 1080p, which is a 19% increase over stock. Overall then, it is safe to say the Sapphire Pulse is an extremely capable graphics card. It's not trying to do anything too flashy or fancy, but it's got a very solid cooler, it's extremely quiet under load, and I have to say I do really like the understated design. I also think the lack of bells and whistles really makes sense for a GPU of this price class. If you're already going to be spending money on something like a 6800 XT or a 6900 XT, then you may want to spend a little bit more and get something like the Nitro Plus, which does have those extra features like dual BIOS, ARGB fan headers, and so on. For the 6600 XT though, I really think you want to be getting a GPU as close to the MSRP as possible, and that really is what the Pulse is all about. We can see that from the MSRP as set by Sapphire, as it only comes in with a $20 premium over AMD's $379 baseline. The elephant in the room though is going to be the 3060 Ti, and as we said yesterday, I really do think the 3060 Ti is just an all round better GPU. The Sapphire Pulse is still a very, very good AIB card, and it really wouldn't disappoint if you did get one, but for me, I think AMD has just set the pricing of the 6600 XT too high, where it's now competing with the 3060 Ti, which really isn't a battle that GPU can win. Anyway guys, that really is going to do it for this review. If you liked it, please leave me a thumbs up. And as always, let me know your thoughts down below. What do you make of this Sapphire Pulse card? And is it one you would consider? You can also subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell. And why not come chat with us over on our Discord server, which is linked in the description below. While you're there, you can also check out our merch store. And why not consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early, and get access to exclusive giveaways. That is it for this one though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.